This week you have readings on Native American identity. Uh, the first one by Cornell and Hartman is actually helping us conceptualize the differences between race and ethnicity. So essentially we're going to unpack how these two concepts are different by using the example of Native Americans. And therefore the second reading you have is by Joanne Nagel who looks at how Native American identity is politically constructed. And then you have the last piece, which looks at the meanings in our current scenario where you might be hearing the term BIPOC, which is Black Indigenous People of Color. And we just want to be on the same page about what that term means and why it's coming up right now. So if we want to start off with just unpacking the differences between race and ethnicity, the first thing to consider is that race and ethnicity in the U.S. have to be understood in the context of immigration. Just to do a quick recap, immigration in the U.S. is broadly divided into two major waves in our history. The first wave of migration is happening turn of the century, primarily from Europe, Central, Eastern, Southern Europe, where you have Italians, Slavs, Polish, Jewish immigrants coming in. The second wave of migration happens post-1965, when we open up immigration very selectively, but this time from all over the world. So that now you see a much larger flow of immigrants of color. So when we were covering ethnic options under Mary Waters, we were looking at the intersection between race and ethnicity. In the U.S., there's a tendency to have a lot of inconsistency and ambiguity about what those terms mean. One of the things that we do is we constantly treat race or ethnicity as an individual characteristic rather than systemic or having deeper societal roots. The second thing we do is we assume these are instrumentalist, as in they are a means to an end. That end may be social mobility. So the idea is ethnicity is required maybe when you don't have other forms of cultural capital you can remain in your ethnic enclave and get support from your ethnic networks and so on. And once you have assimilated into the mainstream, you no longer require your ethnic identity. Again, ethnicity as a means to an end, as an instrument for social mobility. And finally, we have often conflated race and ethnicity or subsumed ethnicity. In the U.S. context, again, the meanings associated with race and ethnicity have changed over time. We've mentioned in our class scientific racism that existed turn of the century with the eugenics movement and theories of polygenesis, different species and whatnot, and then a lot of the biological genetic evidence um, dismisses some of those theories, right? So one of the characters, um, Franz Boas, it, who's known as the father of anthropology, points out that there are cultural differences rather than innate biological ones. And he's the person who extends the idea of cultural relativism. So by the time you get to the 1920s, you see a lot of sociological analysis coming out of the Chicago School with Robert Park and his colleagues talking about the assimilationist model. And they imagine assimilation as linear. There's a period of contact for newly arrived immigrants. There's a period of accommodation and then finally assimilation. And the way the assimilation is presented it is that U.S. is like a melting pot. 
essentially all of us come here with different ethnic identities and we eventually get melted into the pot and become American. We give up being ethnic to become American. Now, of course, we know that this idea was largely developed in the context of the first wave of migration, which consisted of primarily immigrants from Europe. The model does not quite apply to immigrants who came in the second wave for two reasons. One is, of course, uh, they have been called the so-called unmeltables by Bonilla Silva. They can be used to stir the pot. They can be used as kindle for the pot, but they cannot be melted into the pot because we are a highly racialized society, right? So immigrants of color, irrespective of which generation, remain hyphenated Americans, right? And this is what Mary Waters was pointing out last week. So instead of assimilation now, folks started talking about pluralism. Right? So first of all, they can't be melted. Second, a lot of immigrants did not want to give up their ethnic identity if it meant that becoming American would be assimilating into a white mainstream. Right? So they wanted to hold on to a heritage and so on. So you have the idea of pluralism that comes up middle of the 20th century. So instead of a melting pot, now we start talking about an ethnic mosaic, or if you want to stay with food metaphors, you can call it a salad bowl instead of a melting pot and so on, where we all maintain our distinct ethnic So into this, Cornell and Hartman bring on their idea of theory of ethnicity. They say that ethnicity has been imagined in two major ways. One is looking at the primordial aspects of many ways you can think of it as the aspect of ethnicity which gives you the goosebumps, right? This idea of a supposed shared ancestry, um, it imagines ethnicity as fixed and fundamental, right? even though we know in sociology that both race and ethnicity are social constructs right? and are fluid. So the primordial view captures the more emotive aspects of ethnicity, of this supposed common ancestry, um, kinship, etc. The circumstantial aspect of ethnicity, which is from the more instrumentalist perspective, is looking at how individuals or groups claim an ethnic identity when it serves a purpose, when it's to their advantage, and once it no longer serves that purpose, they get rid of that ethnic identity. Right? So that's a purely instrumentalist assumption. Cornell and Hartman say that both these perspectives have primordialism has certain insights, circumstantialism has certain insights. They're presenting the idea that ethnic and racial identities are built, rebuilt, and sometimes dismantled. Clearly, the circumstances play a role, right? At the same time, Primordialism also plays a role, right? Because indeed folks do have emotive connections with their ethnic identity. But the constructionist approach extended by Cornell and Hartman adds in a dose of activism or agency is how we call it in sociology. Agency in how the group contributes in shaping their own ethnic identity, right? So you have the circumstances, you have the primordial aspects, emotive aspects, and then the group's agency in how they shape their identity. Cornell and Hartman, as they're saying, like the, that ethnic identities are built, rebuilt, dismantled, and they look at essentially the intensity of an ethnic identity based on an axis, 
first how comprehensive is that ethnic or racial identity second is it an assigned or asserted identity they explain this by giving you examples ethnic identity is something that affects all aspects of your life comprehensive assigned identity is an identity over which you have no control little agency involved it's an identity assigned to you by the mainstream or the dominant group right so you have very little agency or choice in how you want to be perceived it's just how you are perceived by the dominant group so an example of that would be black south african thick and asserted would be afrikaners which was the white group in south africa of dutch and english ancestry this was a group that had a comprehensive identity because again south africa had apartheid which is you were segregated by your racial group and organized in a hierarchy but they also uh, were the dominant group so their identity is asserted as afrikaners then you have thin and assigned this would be assigning the label asian american to recently arrived vietnamese or cambodian immigrants because for first generation newly arrived immigrants we don't know how relevant the label asian american is as yet at the same time it's an assigned label right um they don't necessarily have a choice of saying hey no i am vietnamese because the mainstream or dominant society is assigning the label Asian American to them. And then finally, you have Italian American, which in present times is thin and asserted. So that's the other interesting thing. There's movement along this axis, right? If you look at turn of the century, Italian American would have been more thick and assigned, right? There was discrimination against the Italian Americans. They were more segregated. And then you move to present times when it has become a thin and asserted. So again, for Cornell and Hartman, ethnic identity is more asserted, race is more assigned. They are both socially constructed. One is based on putatively primordial characteristics. The other one is based on more supposedly shared genes, we know both these are, are social constructs, right? And of course, the power relations aspect is less prominent in ethnic, ethnic identity and very prominent in racial identity. Hence, Mary Waters' assertion that people of color in the U.S. presently have very little choice in terms of how they want to assert their ethnicity. I think there are other differences that we should keep in mind. Race often tends to be unitary. You're either black or not, right? Whereas you can embrace multiple affiliations. I'm part Irish, part Swedish, and so on. Race is institutionalized in a way that has profound consequences that we see in law enforcement or housing segregation or schooling. Racial identity can become transformed into ethnic identity, right? So this is some this is an empirical question that needs to be looked at more. For instance, you have the identity Asian American, which can take on asserted aspects once we had the Asian American movement, right? Where it was no longer simply an assigned label, but folks embraced it and asserted it as an ethnic identity. And really important, the politics of this non-distinction between race and ethnicity, because ethnicity is about multiculturalism and very surface level fluff, where we all celebrate all kinds of cuisines and clothes and colorful stuff. Race, on the other hand, gets to the hierarchies, the inequality. Right? And if we conflate the two, then we can pretend that race is no longer relevant, that we are already in an equal, pluralistic, 
society.